A dynamite. It's Wednesday night with John Pollock and waiting here at postwrestling.com. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. How are you tonight, Way? Doing pretty well, John. How about you? I'm I'm going on very minimal sleep today, but I am I am ready to go. Any particular reason? Uh it was um a late night for me. I went to sleep around 1 30 or so. And then I woke up at six, so that was uh, that was my sleep for the evening. It was partially my own fault. I was, uh, I, I was doing work stuff, so I was up late. It was it the Tuesday. CM Punk stuff? Uh, that uh, that did happen at the end, like right as I was finishing. That happened, so I had to write something up about that. Um, oh, but anyway, I was glad I was still awake when that occurred. So. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into all of that. That is obviously the big story. We'll go through Dynamite, take some of your feedback. I understand, Way. We're going to have poll results today. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, sure. By the end of the show, hopefully, if, if we're still around in about uh, an hour and a half. Yeah. All right. Well, let's actually dive into the news involving CM Punk. He was the big reveal at the end of Tuesday night's live edition of WWE Backstage uh, coming out. This was a... Uh, a super <laughs> kept secret uh, that it sounded like even uh, people on the crew were not aware. The people on screen, save for Renee Young, were not aware. And out walks CM Punk announcing that he'll be back next week. And he is going to be a regular contributor showing up periodically on WWE backstage. Yeah, I guess this was their, I guess, equivalent of, you know, hiding somebody in the back of a truck and... Uh, you know, making sure that nobody saw him, including the people there. I, I thought it made for a really nice, genuine reaction from from especially somebody like Paige. Uh, and certainly a shock that I didn't expect to get at midnight at the end of this particular show. Uh, so it's... Do you think that that was a case of almost overthinking themselves that had there been at least a hint of it in the hours leading up to the show that that would have serve the curiosity factor, and next week you get the what's he going to say? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think anyone was tuning into this, and it was pretty much two minutes at the end of the show that uh, the reveal, I don't think there was going to be any impact felt. No, no. Um, I mean, but I, I'm i guessing they, they're banking on this clip just, you know, traveling virally, which it did immediately. And, and I building think next week's number. That's the focus. Not that on. seemed to me more This more week intent. just seemed to be, yeah, it was... And, and we're going to surprise everybody. And who knows when the deal was struck? Maybe they didn't have a deal up until, you know, very early into into the recording of this particular show. But either way, they will certainly reap the benefits next week. Yeah, uh, this week, you know, last week they got off to a disastrous start. They had 49,000 viewers. This week they did 100. So, you know, it was interesting in looking at the ratings that both uh, WWE Backstage and Total Divas just plummeted last week with terrible numbers and there was a certain level of bounce up this week uh total divas was back to only having the third lowest number in their history this week and uh backstage up to a hundred thousand but next week will be the big one to see how curious everyone is to see and how much interest there will be over the long period of seeing cm punk in this kind of a role on a studio show like this is a deal through fox he does not have a deal with WWE, and it's just, after all this time, this is his uh, dipping the toe back into something WWE-related. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we've certainly, I think, seen the bottom of what this particular show can do. Uh, I would imagine that number to, do you, I mean, how do you even predict something like this, but do you have a prediction about, about what backstage can climb to on FS1 with the addition of somebody like CM Punk? Uh, next week will be the test. I think at that time slot, I mean, if they did a hundred thousand this week, I mean, I, I would hope that they could do three hundred next week. 
But I, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not expecting like this is going to do a million viewers or anything. Oh like God, that. no, no. no like that, this it's it's great for backstage that they've got CM Punk. It's just, um, you know, certainly everyone can just look at this. Is this going to be Punk's uh, reintroduction to, you know, WWE at a distance that over time that this will grow into most into more? I think that's what everyone uh, is looking at now, and that'll ultimately. Uh, come down to punk because I don't think there's a doubt in the world that WWE will be open to the idea of punk uh, getting integrated into the WWE system itself from the fan base. I'm sure that, you know, that is the expectation that this means CM Punk is back in the WWE and that he will uh, eventually find his way into, into a ring somehow. I, I wonder if in punk's mind, how close he thinks he might be to that uh, expectation. I, I wonder, I wonder, because he seemed like from all indications that he, he, you know, listening to him in interviews and whatnot, he, he sees this as a non WWE role. And I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm really curious to see what type of analysis he'll provide. Certainly the expectation is for him to, to, you know, be, um, uh, not handcuffed and to say if he doesn't like something exactly how he feels or if he likes something exactly how he feels. How will he fare in this system of, you know, um, kind of pseudo kayfabe, but pseudo reality talk that that show's established? Yeah. And, you know, what the the show's uh, producers, how they reacted to last week's number. Obviously, I think that that only heightened the desire to go after someone like CM Punk because this show needed that shot in the arm. And you also saw on Tuesday's show, I have not seen the whole show but you did have the segment where, uh, with the, with the exception of Renee, they all kind of buried the the Rusev Lana storyline, and it seems like they're going to go to an extent to make differentiate this from the kickoff show, which I think people were comparing it to after the first week. I have to imagine maybe at some point that was like part of. I wonder if there's like a company directive to to say, okay, if something's not good, you have to be able to say it because Corey Graves did the same. You know, on his podcast, talking about Lana and, and Rusev. Um, so I, I, I think in both examples, you they have to have that that latitude because if not, it's you it's lose not credibility. For, it's not going to work for the medium that the, and the audience that they're trying to attract for these shows. And nor does I, I think Fox want that on this show. Like you, mm-hmm. you know, just the fact that they were the ones going out to to bring in a punk and reaching out to Jim Ross at the time. I mean, you could see like they wanted to have a show that is much closer to a, you know, a, a critical look at the product as, as well as a promotional vehicle. And I think that's the same balancing act that the podcast is going to have to have. Like it is under the WWE umbrella, but a WWE kickoff. I don't mean to rail on the kickoff panel, but everyone knows what the kickoff panel is. And that in podcast form is, isn't going to fly it's almost what is the point of doing this the kickoff panel is really just a barker show it's a way for them to try to get you to buy the pay-per-view at the last minute whereas this is framing itself as a bit of a news show rather than simply a promotional product um and i i certainly think like you know when it comes to these types of shows credibility is and authenticity are very very important and certainly if you're going to have somebody like cm punk who arguably is you know the the symbol in the professional wrestling industry that represents those two things the most, it the expectation is going to be on him to be like the CM Punk of old, like the CM Punk that you've, you know, you you would you would have heard on the Cole Cabana podcast. Maybe not that honest, but you know, at least a version of that isn't too different from I think the CM Punk we've we've all come to expect. So I'm sure it would be in Fox's interest to let him say something controversial in those first first couple episodes. Now, for you, it's just the viewer way. Are you just strictly interested in this guy because of his his delivery? He's got you know his his opinions that will be out there. Like, where do you think he, like his actual analysis is going to mark? Up? Like, if you've listened to this guy's interviews, this guy's not following anything. Not you know at what all. I mean? Yeah. Like he's picking this up. Like I'm sure he's going to be watching the shows now to be able to comment on it. But in terms of like this is a name value addition to WWE backstage, but in terms of you know him breaking down storylines, like this is a guy that's been completely out of it for five plus years. 
And that's not necessarily a, neg- a bad thing. You know, I think him coming in as somewhat of a casual viewer at this point, but with a great deal of obviously, you know, personal experience, he can c- come in and just come right out and say, now, why are they doing this? This makes no sense. And this makes no sense. Or I like this. I thought this was a good match. And here's why. That's the level of analysis I'm kind of expecting, you know, something similar to maybe what you and I do, John, but maybe, you know, from him, obviously a, a voice with a lot of credibility given, you know, his personal experience and also a bit more of a casual experience, uh, a casual viewers kind of perspective as well. That's what I'm expecting. What do you think they cover next week? Because I think next week it should be, you know, the big, it should be the WWE backstage version. That being, I think a sanitized version of the art of wrestling interview. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Um, because yeah. next week, I, I don't think you want to hear him talking about uh, the NXT invasion. I think next week is mm-hmm. you're back. Why? And yeah. going through. And that's really on the other panel of how introspective their line of questions will be and what you can get out of him. Because I I, I think that will be interesting just to see how, how deep he goes. Is the lawsuit brought up from... Uh, Dr. Chris Amon, um, what, hmm. I mean, there's, there's different ways you can go and that'll be interested, interesting to see topics covered and topics that are, uh, avoided. Right. My expectation, I don't know how much time they would spend on punk himself. Uh, I agree that it would be awkward to just go right into the news without maybe addressing some of the, some of those things. I, something tells me that they won't spend like, you know half an hour on it or anything but maybe maybe a certain few questions at the beginning um i would also love for them to like i don't know maybe like do a special with the guy explaining all these questions yeah that's that's going to be the ultimate test is that right now he's got this deal with fox how long until wwe wants to do business with him and what is punk's attitude towards doing business from wwe because you know, when when the news got out that he had auditioned for this, he made it clear that this was with Fox. This was not with WWE. And, you know, you can you can read into some of his answers and how they've evolved over the years about, you know, uh, uh, up until uh, All Out Weekend with Mike Johnson and stating, you know, if, if they're calling, I'm not going to not answer the phone. That's a mm-hmm. far cry from I will never go back there. And the... And also adding the fact that he has dropped a lot of that anger that he held in the past. And if I had gone through, I mean, and this is all how you view that lawsuit. It was technically a lawsuit filed by Dr. Chris Amon. WWE has never denied that they assisted in that lawsuit. And I think if you put all the pieces together and CM Punk certainly spoke about this publicly, he very much felt that the WWE was behind that. And that's a very big and difficult A grudge, I would say, to get over if you're punk, that even though you won that case, uh, that was a costly, costly legal battle that the company put you through and mental anguish for several years. Or if you're Chris Amon, who might be put into a position to have to work with this this guy again. Wouldn't that be strange? Yeah, I would imagine that would be an absolute no-go, that he would, that those two would be kept completely separate if we're getting to the point of, CM Punk wrestling a match, which you have to be even the the biggest pessimist of Punk ever doing a match again in WWE. You have to be softening that stance today. I personally think it's only a matter of time. Um, You know, just hearing, knowing Punk's answers and seeing, like, to me, this feels like it's him. Um, Well, first of all, making some extra money, which I'm sure, like, is always. I'm sure he got a great deal. I'm Um, sure there was a great deal. For and him to take here. And I also feel like if there's more money to be made in the form of a full-time wrestling return or part-time wrestling return with a lighter schedule, which I'm sure he'd want, um, I'm, I, I, I don't doubt that he would entertain it. Certainly with added pressure now from the audience as a result of this move, WWE, I think, will be under the gun to, you know, that much, that much more often, that much quicker to try to strike a deal with him. And so I personally think it's only a matter of time. Yeah, so... I guess everything is now uh, just looking towards Tuesday. It's it's a great benefit for WWE backstage, but you're going to be talking about CM Punk on a WWE-related program that's going to be doing just a fraction of the viewership of Raw or or SmackDown. So that part's interesting, but I'm sure that very much, you know, I'm sure there's there's bitter feelings on both sides, but I think it's more so today that's 
I think if Punk wanted to be on either show, I think the door will be open now. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, let's uh, let's look at some numbers from uh, the past couple of days as we uh, get up to speed here. Uh, I mentioned Total Divas, so last week they had plummeted to 191,000 viewers. This week they were back up to 258 thousand viewers so take that for what you will as we mentioned backstage was up to a hundred thousand viewers next week what's your prediction for next week's number you know i'm gonna say somewhere between the range of uh, maybe as high as 350 um i'm gonna say so maybe 330 to like 380 i guess i can't see them hitting any of those numbers that they got with those those lead-ins that they had like the alcs lead-in and even having smackdown as a lead-in where they did those big bigger Six figure numbers. I I don't see them doing that in that Tuesday night slot. But that is, and and how much of um promotion? You know, of the, how much promotion will it get on Raw, if any? That's a that's a phenomenal point. Uh, I, I think they will push this really hard on SmackDown and Raw because they this is their product, uh, even if it's a a Fox produced one. Mm-hmm. So I do see them pushing it significantly. But that 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 is very interesting to see how they. It's one thing to push it on their YouTube and on the website. Very different to see what they do on SmackDown and Raw over the next week. Mm -hmm. And speaking of promotion, this is kind of just a sidebar. With NXT coming so close last week to topping AEW, were you surprised at all that this week on Raw, I mean, I, I thought that they might just give you something to really push you because I think had they promoted like one person showing up at NXT this week, I think they win it. Well, that's what I was really curious to know about today, you know, with the ratings being as close as they were last week, how many people might have decided to tune in this week to NXT instead of AEW Dynamite. Uh, you, you know, they, they had to do a tape show in the UK. That's certainly no excuse because by that point they knew what, what the state, what, you know, how close this race was. But I, I agree with you, a missed opportunity. Um, maybe they were somewhat handcuffed too without like um, anybody but Shayna Baszler and also NXT UK talent available there. Um, but th- th- this for tonight's show for the for raw i meant oh for raw yeah i, I meant just for, yeah for tonight like you know you had you had bailey at the end of tonight's show that had they somehow promoted that ahead of time i wonder if that would have made any kind of a difference but it's Actually, just interesting bailey i don't think so um bailey probably not i think last week had they mentioned ahead of time that the oc you set an angle up on raw that they're going to nxt i think that would have been the difference of 9,000 viewers to yeah. top AEW last week. So Perhaps. interesting this week that Raw, you know, didn't do anything um, to to push it that hard. But um, anyway, Raw on Monday, this was the, the tape show, the three-day tape delayed show, 2,058,000 viewers, lowest number of the year, um, but only down um, a small number from, from last week. They were down 3.5% in overall viewership, but there was a tremendous fall throughout this show. Uh, From the first to third hour, they lost 25% of their viewership. Uh, The third hour was only viewed by uh, an average of 1,753,000 viewers. That would be the least watched uh, third hour in the history of three-hour Raws as well. Um, I guess, you know, they, they maintained 2 million viewers, and they also went up against the biggest Monday night football game of the year, uh, with uh, the 49ers and Seahawks doing 16 million viewers. Um, do you look at this as good, bad, or just throw this number out for this week, Way For me, I think it, 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 it says that there's a real habitual, I think, um, I don't know, audience that will just watch Raw at 8 o'clock on a Monday night, no matter what, um, unless there's, you know, stiff competition. But Which, by the way, the first hour this week, was higher, not by much, but was higher than last week's first hour. Mm-hmm. So that tells me the tape nature Means didn't nothing. affect anyone from tuning in. They did tune out during the show, but they were interested at eight o'clock to watch this show. I think I think what affects where ta- uh, tape nature might affect it is if they don't deliver a great tape show, and as you know, maybe because they they don't see a reason to deliver their best type of show in a tape. When when a show is taped anyway is is what I mean, um and and I think you see the result there. Ultimately, it, I I think it largely depends on the quality of the show and also what you have set up for the main event. And clearly, whatever they what did they do? Did they do? Uh, was it a women's? Um, what did they do in the main event? 
It was the the six man with uh, Randy Orton, Ricochet, and Carrillo against the OC. Yeah, I mean, evidently that wasn't enough to keep people people around. I'm guessing. I'd love to know how how well the Rusev Lana thing did. Yeah, that was right at the end of hour two, start of hour three. Something I believe. like that. Yeah. Anyway, so that was the raw number um, uh, that you can uh, read many different ways. There, there's nothing I enjoy more way than just throwing out the numbers and then just watching the comments. It's usually it'll be anywhere from 24 to 48 hours of just people going to war with one another. It's fantastic. Everybody's a statistician. I love it. Um, Some uh, updates about uh, a few contracts here. This was uh, announced on WWE Backstage. Contract extensions for The Miz and Paige. Um, These were reported by Ryan Satin, and then PW Insider added the lengths that The Miz already had a contract through 2022, so this replaces that deal so he is now under contract till 2025 page uh her deal is a four-year term through 2023 um Mm -hmm. i guess with the miz it was just you know locking in guys long term and for page maybe that's the more interesting one because it tells me that page is probably mentally at ease with the idea she is never wrestling again because if she had that glimmer of hope of wrestling again it would have to be outside of WWE. This tells me that she probably got a really nice offer for a non-wrestling role, and that's probably what's going to be um, the extent of her, the, the end of her wrestling career. I would say WWE might also be the place that will provide her with the most opportunities, you know, in the form of things like WWE backstage and, you know, being a manager and who knows what other, you know, non-wrestling opportunities it may provide. Uh, right. I think she's still a very valuable asset to them, especially coming off of, the Dwayne Johnson film and clearly somebody who is very talented on the microphone that uh, I don't know if like backstage is going to be our ultimate, um, you know, application. Cause I certainly think that she's capable of a lot more creatively as part of some act or, or even as, as a GM for the short time that she was there, I thought she was great. So I guess these, these next several years opened up a lot of possibilities for whatever. And then just the, the the final note, this was also on backstage that Johnny Gargano is off the takeover card. They're not gonna now gonna be doing Finn Balor against Matt Riddle at War Games and taking Riddle out of the War Games match itself to replace Johnny Gargano. Right. Yeah. Um so this was a neck injury. Do you do you what do you think it's a result from and, and did it have anything to do with that um bloody Sunday he took on the ramp by Finn Balor? So that's what was cited. I I haven't been told otherwise. I, I don't know 100% if, if that was it or if it was something um, that he was dealing with earlier. I would say if he had a neck injury, I would be very surprised that they would green light that spot then. Mm-hmm. So right. um, that that's what was reported. So I, I don't have anything that would contradict that that spot. I mean, it did look pretty pretty brutal just watching it. Yeah. So... Uh, and no time frame either for Gargano, but obviously a neck injury, uh, that's, you know, something serious to monitor. Uh, all of anything else, way? I wanted to say, uh, if no more news, I'd like to give something away. Oh, of course. Yes. Uh, it is time to give away a post-wrestling prize pack. So for all members of the post-wrestling cafe, this is where we put your name into, uh, the world's largest hat and way has grabbed this hat. And he is going to reach down deep and choose a name from the hat. And this week's winner, our Post Wrestling Cafe member that is going to be sporting some brand new Post Wrestling threads, as the kids would say, is... Congratulations to David Spence. David Spence out of Pittsburgh. You win a Post Wrestling combo pack consisting of a t-shirt, stickers, coffee sleeve, and postcard right from store.postwrestling.com where you can get all of your merchandise from Post Wrestling. Fantastic. Congratulations, uh, David Spence. I uh, also want to make mention that uh, up on the site, a terrific review of Thor Ragnarok with Wei Ting and his new uh, movie reviewer, Daniel Perry. A fantastic chat about uh, Thor Ragnarok. Uh, I had a wonderful time talking about uh, one of my favorite MCU movies with Daniel, who comes with uh, a lot of industry experience, having actually worked as a digital distributor for Disney, uh, working to help promote a lot of these MCU movies. So he was able to offer a great deal of insight into what I thought was a wonderful film. And I, you know, he did a great job, 
But I think the audience would still very much like your opinions on this movie, John. So whenever you get a chance, please uh, update us. I'll do my best uh, to watch this. I've uh, even in t- at one and a half speed. I think you'll we'll, we'll, you'll be allowed for this one. This is a uh, this is a post pro res week, so I've got my homework assignment. So I've been I've been going through Noah. I've been going through Big Japan, uh, but Th- Thor Ragnarok is on the list. You know what I have still not seen that. I'm just trying to find some time to is the Jordan Devlin David Star match. Have you seen that yet? I have. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, Man, it's, I just need to sit down and watch this thing. I've uh, I've been putting it off, and I've just heard uh, amazing things. I've still got uh, the James Ian Allen podcast here for when I watch this. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of great buzz about that one, and I would say it's well worth watching. I mean, if you have any, if you have no idea what's going on. Just watch the Sean Ryan videos. Even if you're not going to watch the match, watch the Sean Ryan videos. Watch all of them that that they've released this year. And then I'm pretty sure you'll want to watch the match itself anyway. Uh, And just a a quick look at the days coming up. Uh, Up next, already has a show up right now covering Wednesday night's show. Thursday on the Cafe Hangout, we'll be joined by our own Andrew Thompson, who's got a busy week here at Post Wrestling. Uh, That is 3 o'clock Eastern for all members of the Post Wrestling Cafe. You can tune in for that. Friday, we have a new British wrestling experience with Martin, Benno, and Jamesy. Way and I will be back Friday night with Rewind to SmackDown on the cafe. Saturday is the Rocky Maivia Picture Show. Nate will be joined by Andrew Thompson reviewing Planet 51, starring Dwayne Johnson. Amazing. And then, and then Sunday, it is episode four of Thunderstruck. WH Park will be joined by Emily Pratt chatting Jushin Thunder Liger and Brian Pillman from February of 1992 at Super Brawl 2. And then myself and WH Park late Sunday night with Post Pro Res. Wonderful. And I also want to mention our friends, Braden and Davey. Not only do they review NXT, but on the free feed right now, you can also find a review of The Mandalorian from Disney Plus, the new series about. Are you going to be watching that, John, too, when you have time? The Mandalorian? I, I've heard great things about it. Um, are you familiar when... with what a Mandalorian is? Uh, I know it's part of the Star Wars franchise, and that is the absolute extent of my knowledge. It's all you really need to know. Yes. So uh, those guys do a great deal of movie reviews and also a bunch of bonus podcasts on their own Patreon. So uh, do do give them a, a look at, I believe it's patreon.com slash upnext, U-P-N-X-T. Uh, a great deal of bonus content just for $5 a month as well, including a preview of one of those movies or one of those uh, bonus podcasts in The Mandalorian, again, on the free feed right now. Yeah, uh, you know, sometimes we keep an eye out on what they're doing on their Patreon, and maybe one of these days, Wayne and I are going to go storm the BDE. Oh, so just we'll promote it ahead of time, though. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a lot closer than nine thousand viewers. <laughs> All right, so let us chat about AEW Dynamite, their first uh, first Dynamite coming off of a pay per view, and I guess that's going to be interesting to see this NXT invasion that has provided an upswing in NXT viewership versus uh, is Dynamite going to receive a post pay-per-view bump that WWE typically experiences? I Mm -hmm. I feel they will. Yeah. You know, it would have been a really interesting, I think battle had the invasion taken place like this past week versus this Dynamite show. Um, Those two things going together would have been really interesting, but I'm really interested to see too, like how much NXT retained and how much AEW gained from the the post pay-per-view. Well, uh, regardless of whatever either show does, um, both shows will be uh, dead on arrival in my comments after <laughs> I announce these numbers. It is uh, yeah. just pandemonium, everybody. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee was the site of Dynamite at the Municipal Auditorium. And they started off the show with like a two-minute highlight package going through all of the matches from full gear. And we also got the return of Tony Schiavone tonight with Jim Ross and Excalibur and... Jim Ross was running down the show and mentioned that tonight we're going to get the rematch, the third match between Hangman Page and Pac, and said how great it was at Fully Loaded. Uh, That it was, yeah. Did you want me to say something else Um, about that? uh, Well... (laughs) <laughs> which, which fully loaded pay per view? Oh, he said uh, fully loaded. I didn't even. Yeah, catch, that was the, didn't that even was catch the joke. It. <laughs> yes, instead of full gear. Oh man. Um. Then he recapped the lights out match, and we get this video package of Kenny Omega being checked on by uh, Doctor Sampson in the back. He's got this black eye and these awful looking scabs on his back, like and thick, thick, he, thick scars. It looks like. 
whatever yes. they were. Yeah. Uh, he has not been cleared this week. And then he asks, what about Moxley? And Dr. Sampson says, well, he, he was beat up pretty bad too, but uh, he was cleared. And Omega <laughs> is so sad. He just puts his head down like, oh, <laughs> healthy motherfucker. And he walks out and you just see this shot of a concerned looking Michael Nakazawa and Riho. Mm -hmm. I love this. I love that they followed up on the story of the loser of the match rather than just forgetting about him. You know, there's often so much, if not even more story to be told from the perspective of the person who lost the match than there is with somebody who won. And here we have Kenny, you know, not just suffering, licking his wounds from the loss, but finding out the guy who beat the shit out of him is cleared and he isn't. So, man, it gives so much motivation for revenge so, or some sort of character growth for Kenny that I just absolutely can't wait to see. I, I also loved how this bled right into a match between Mox and Kenny's, you know, best friend at AEW in uh, Michael Nakazawa. I personally think you would have been better off just having um, Moxley come out and do his normal entrance smiling. And I, I think this was the week to do a comedy promo. Yeah, I I don't disagree. I think it would have only been better if Moxley started throwing out some pancakes. Yeah, because you don't want to make uh, you can't be weak. You can't be weak. He should have. He sh they shouldn't have even referenced the loss because it You're just right. makes him so so weak. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So they they killed him here. He's done. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's refreshing. It's refreshing to see a, a a loser of a match actually take it hard and take it seriously. So then John Moxley comes out, and this place is going nuts for him. They're chanting for him. Um, you know, you know, this was um, a very polarizing match on Saturday, but I thought it was like a good kind of polarization that in the end, I think it really helped this match be remembered a bit more than just this uh, match. You know, we, we, we see so many matches that 24 hours later, they're forgotten and we're on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that Moxley coming out felt bigger after this match. And I think, you know, to your point of how they recap Omega, I, I think both kind of gained from this. I think so too. But I mean, I came from the perspective of somebody who really liked the match. So I, you know, I, I know John, you, you might've been less high on it, but I also know there are people that absolutely hated the match. So I'm curious to know how those people might have felt coming out of this. But certainly in the arena, you got the sense that both of these men, Moxley, you know, uh, especially because they, he came out in front of the live audience, had lived through a war. And so he comes out of here, uh, out of that match looking just like, you know, that much more of a badass. I thought they should have done the NWA Power Open for Dynamite this week. And instead, it would be the tweets after the Lights Out oh, match, great culminating idea. with Renee's. <laughs> That's right. That would be great. Yeah. So WTF. John Moxley versus Michael Nakasawa and everyone's going nuts for Moxley. He just comes out of the corner, ducks a lariat, paradigm shift, and he wins this one in a minute and nine seconds. And he, he, Nakazawa started the match like uh holding his baby oil and then dropping it to show you that he was taking this one seriously. And Moxley said that was quick. He said, I'm not a liar. I told you what would happen at full gear. Omega will never be the same again. And he makes an open challenge for anyone that wants to fight him, but warns them to kiss your loved ones. Goodbye. Have an ambulance on speed dial and don't ask for any apologies afterwards. This guy just felt like a just tremendous, tremendous baby face. Oh, so good. I mean, they could have this easily... baby face that makes promises that, uh, sees them through and just that that kick ass baby face that people get behind. Let's also remember that this was like a double baby face feud where, you know, coming out of it, that aspect did not seem to hinder them at all. Like it, it, it at the end of that whole thing, you are still left with two people that seem to want to beat the shit out of each other and Kenny, especially now, wanting revenge on John Moxley, or at least feeling that much more kind of like sad because he didn't managed to beat Moxley. I, I thought it was interesting how, like, they did the squash match here with John Moxley, who certainly didn't really need it. But, you know, they could have easily started this off with, like, just a promo, as you might, you know, often see in a wrestling show. But instead, they went with a squash match and then the promo, which I guess would have helped, like, attract eyeballs on live TV with a match first. Um, 
really good. Yeah, they, they never promoted the match. They only promoted, we're going to he- mm-hmm. hear from John Moxley. So they almost like snuck a squash match in when your attention was heightened. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, really good statement of intent from Moxley. It, to me, it was almost like the cherry on top of a great pay-per-view main event he had. He really does come out of this week's events feeling like he's, you know, certainly vying for, if not cemented, a top position in AEW. Next match was Dark Order against Jungle Boy and Marco Stunt. And player Uno gets on the microphone and he wants Marco Stunt in the ring. And they start the match. They Early on, they double team uh, Grayson, including Marco jumping off of Jungle Boy's back with this cannonball. Uh, Uno comes in, hit a swanton off the top and appeared to overshoot Marco, but he sold it anyway. That's how powerful Uno's head was. Grayson then leaps over the top and comes down on stunt on the edge of the apron. That looked crazy. They fought through the commercial break. Hot tag gets made. Uh, Jungle Boy dives to the floor. Then Marco, uh, while holding on to Jungle Boy, scales the ropes and slips on the top, but then just recovered to hit the Dragon Rana onto Grayson. But Uno shoved Jungle Boy to break up that cover. Jungle Boy then uh, dives to the floor, and he's blocked by both members of Dark Order who hit him with flying knees and then the Nightfall Backbreaker is hit to Marco Stunt, and then they hit Fatality as Uno pinned Marco in nine and a half minutes. I thought it was like a really fun opening match. I mean, there were some blemishes in there, but I don't think it was enough to, you know, take take away that much from it. I think Marco Stunt, for all the controversy that's been surrounding him, I love him in these opening matches. Like, like it or not, he's really becoming a stand-up performer that really captures your attention when he's in there, especially against these big guys working that, like, spectacular, like, high-flying style. So I, I think the, the, the kid's a star, whether you, whether you like it or not. I, I think he's kind of surpassed Jungle Boy in the, oh, in the sure. role of, like, yeah. that, like, he kind of has everyone's attention in these matches. And I think that it was Jungle Boy that was trying to, to, kind of get the same level of attention, but it was Marco that everyone was behind in this match as the undersized baby face, which is typically Jungle Boy, Boy's role, but he kind of defers to Marco in that role here. Though I, I feel like Jungle Boy is more of like a long-term prospect where I think he could fit in very well in, you know, either your, your cruiserweight or, or, or maybe even, even eventually with some size, a heavyweight program. Um, I, yeah, you're right though. I think lately with Stunt being the smaller man, he does take a bit of a backseat. But, you know, it's it's still early for them. And you can argue Stunt needs the spotlight more than more than Jungle Boy at this point. I also thought this was a pretty good uh, performance by Dark Order, in particular Stu Grayson, who I think is, uh, you know, these guys are, they've still got these bloody creepers that are just, it's just such a death entrance for it's these guys. It's not just the creepers, but the gimmick itself, you know? It's goofy. It's very it, goofy. It's generic. It comes across like it's sort of like a... I don't know, a, a cheap, cheap version of like the Ministry of Darkness or any sort of like, I don't know, satanic gimmick that's come across in the past. I'd really love them to like find a way to make it a bit more themselves, whether it be with a bit more per- personality of some sort, maybe even a bit more comedy attached to the gimmick. Right now, they just come across like, like a parody of like, you know, and not even really a good parody of just that same generic horror gimmick. This is like a high school theatrical production. Yeah. Uno uh, speaks while sitting on top of the creepers and he says Marco could be a winner and tries to recruit him to be a creeper and Jungle Boy intervenes and they get jumped. The fans start chanting for Luchasaurus and they're trying to put the creeper mask onto Jungle Boy when Luchasaurus enters. And (laughs) this was out of like a like like of a, a John Woo film. He just went one by one killing these guys and just one by one knocks them all down. And then there's three creepers in the ring and he hits this spinning wheel kick, knocking all three down at once as he stares down dark order and then proceeded to kill them as well. And then uh, Jurassic express had a big hug and everyone went nuts here. So the, I guess the creepers, you know, if anything, their introduction, led to this moment for Luchasaurus being able to just knock them all out, which perhaps made maybe this was the death it. of the creepers. Maybe they were all killed. <laughs> maybe, but I mean, the putty patrol like springs up every single episode of power Rangers. So I'm sure they'll be back. Um, man, Luchasaurus, he got a holy shit chant for his return here after what, like two weeks away, three weeks away. So in a very short amount of time, like I feel like this injury for him was a real bit of a blessing in disguise. 
as cer- certainly the absence has made him an even bigger star. While at the same time, it gave a chance for Marco Stunt to shine in the spotlight. So this entire Jurassic Express trio feels far more popular now than they did in just a, a few few short weeks ago. Yeah, this got over very big. Luchasaurus is a uh, a monster literally and figuratively for this company that they have on their hands, I think. Mm-hmm. like This guy could be really big, and I think they're, they're aware of what they have in this guy. Sean Spears, Peter Avalon, and Darby Allen in our weirdest three-way combination I can recall. Uh, with Tully Blanchard and Leva Bates in the uh, corners. And Darby Allen introduced by Justin Roberts as skating down to the ring. Mm-hmm. I like it. Way. I like that people get custom announcements, you know? You yeah, have private party, of... private party or wait in at, like, Vodka juice. Cranberry. Yeah, something like wait. that. Mm-hmm. By the way, as we bring up Tully Blanchard, did you watch the Arn Anderson promo on Daniel Tosh? I saw you tweeted. I have not seen oh, it. This, <laughs> I was ready to drop 30 bucks to watch Arn Anderson beat up Daniel Tosh. This promo was so good. And it was just for nothing. It was for like a little comedy bit with Daniel Tosh. It's like this guy should be on TV every week doing promos for on behalf of anyone. It's so, awesome. Oh, it's so nice to have that confirmation that he still has it in him. Um, yeah. I bet you that this guy gave probably two minutes tops of thought before he cut this promo. Perhaps. And, and you know, from I think what, what I heard in some of those scrums, like you have guys like Malenko and I'm sure Arn and maybe even Tully himself, like doing a lot of the coaching for some of these young guys in the back. I can't think of a better coach than some of those names like that. Wow. Well, if AEW isn't going to use this guy, there's no one I want to see walk into the GPB studios more than Arn Anderson. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Can you imagine him with, uh, God, who, who, who would you pair Arn Anderson with? Question mark. I don't know. Uh, who would I do? Eddie Kingston. That'd be great. You could, you could put him with anybody. Oh, it yeah. would be tremendous. So Darby gets shoved off the top, takes this nasty crash landing off the rope onto the canvas. And Sean Spears gets jumped by Joey Janela. And Janela sends him over the guardrail. And then Janela's just screaming into the camera like he's been possessed. And Spears comes back, drags Janela into the AEW universe. And off they go into the abyss. And we never see Sean Spears again. So this was notable, just the fact that they were reigniting this Mm -hmm. when it seemed like they were transitioning Janela to... Kip Sabian, that Janela didn't seem so high on when asked about this. Right, right. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I don't know. I'm guessing it, it at least leads to another match. I mean, they could still use that to springboard to Kip Sabian, but um, Spears, Janela, I don't know if it was like a hot enough program to, to warrant a rematch, but I think, you know, for TV, it's perfectly acceptable. It, it to me, was interesting how big Sean Spears looks in AEW. You know, while in the WWE, very much felt like a middle of the pack guy in AEW against almost all, all of the opponents he's had thus far. He towers almost over everybody. So it's uh, it's I find that pretty fascinating. And yeah, maybe by design in this match, I mean, with yeah. who he was paired with. I mean, he just towered over these two. Mm-hmm. So Allen was left with Avalon. He flipped over into a stunner and hit the coffin drop and won the match in three minutes, 45 seconds. Grabbed the microphone and told John Moxley, I accept. Four words, all he had to say, you know, Darby Allen is so interesting because like he has the type of charisma that's so different from anybody else in pro wrestling. He's not somebody who needs to speak a million words or get get into a super angry pro wrestler mode. It's almost like the less he says, the cooler and more more mysterious he comes across. And this was really apparent to me while watching that scrum from StarCast where he felt nothing like a pro wrestler. In fact, he seemed to have a lot more in common with just like a really cool rock star who just, you know, if he's asked a question, he'll say something, but he'll say it in like with so much attitude that he only needs a few words to, to get exactly what, what comes across. And I guess that wasn't more apparent than when he said you could tell Evolve to go fuck themselves in like the most deadly serious voice. Um, I, I, I think he's great. And I love that he does not feel like a pro wrestler who, who's trying to do an impression of a pro wrestler. Is... Was there a better response, though, to that than Gabe Sapolsky's when he was asked on Twitter? Gabe's was great as well. And it was like the classic Gabe tweet. He responded that uh, 
I actually want to want to pull it up here because I don't want to uh, misread. But can you anyway, please do it, it in Gabe's voice? Let me let me see here <laughs> because this was only on Saturday. This shouldn't have been. Man, this guy. Uh, he is a, he is a, a very a busy tweeter here. I'm just I'm scrolling and I'm only at four hours ago. Okay, there's no way I'm getting all the way back to Saturday. But suffice to say, he essentially said that he didn't care and thought that they did a lot of great stuff together. Uh, if you would like to go see some of that stuff, then go to WWNlive.com for nine ninety nine a month. I was like, that was the best response from Gabe. I think the bigger revelation is exactly how much Gabe Sapolsky tweets. Damn. I'm like trying yeah, I, to scroll through too. Oh, I, I, I'm not going to ever see Saturday. That's just way too much. <laughs> mm. There's got to be a better way to scroll people's timelines on Twitter. So, or, or maybe there okay. shouldn't be. Maybe there shouldn't be. I think we should limit the amount of tweets somebody could make a day. You know you how you suggested limiting ho- car honks? I think yeah, Twitter. which I got backed up by, 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 by Daniel, Daniel on that show. Did you feel a little outnumbered there? <laughs> Two to one, yes. Uh, they should get on that right away. I'm but, with you on tweets. Yeah, you should get um, five well, tweets a day. Five, five. But you know what? Some people can really abuse five. So I would say your limit should go down the more offenses that you have. Yeah. I'm not going to reveal it, but I've I've figured out Twitter. It took me 10 years, but I've, I've figured it out. Deleting Twitter? Uh, I didn't say that. No, I'm. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna share with, with it either. You're not gonna. Why? What's no, the harm? Because uh, I'll, I'll explain my my methodology to you. I have oh. an honest reason for not wanting to to share it. Okay. And I figured. Okay. I figured out Twitter. I've won. You must have a fake account. It's over. No, I don't. I would. I would never do a burner account. That's just. Hmm. Not, I think that's kind of weird. I'm very curious. Do you have a burner account? Are you no. the bane of my existence? <laughs> no, I'm not. That'd be sec- funny, actually. I'm not secretly <laughs> tweeting shit, shit talking uh, John Pollock. No, not at all. Spelling um, my last name wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, any comment on Jordan Miles? While we're oh, talking we, about we, Twitter, we didn't go over that. So he, I only saw the first video, and he stated that he is quitting WWE, and kind of reiterated a lot of his uh, his prior complaints about the company. Uh, calling Jordan Miles his slave name, that the company is racist. Um, I I really, to be honest, I don't know how the company handles this. There is the one thought that how how can these two sides possibly work together? Let's just cut our losses and go our separate ways. The argument against that would be you have a number of people in this company that are very unhappy. Is the, Are we telling people this is your way out and encouraging people to go online and get what they want by getting cut this way. I, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know how you mm. handle this, but the idea of Jordan Miles coming back at this point seems pretty far-fetched. And yeah. and I don't know what's going on with him himself, but it's, um, yeah, I, uh-huh. I don't know. You don't want to speculate. I feel at this point it'd be worse to keep him around and, and not use him just simply out of maybe, you know, um, I don't know what. Um, but I think if the man wants to leave, you just let him leave. But how do you then go to a Mike Bennett or a Sin Cara and say, we are not letting you out? Of the your difference contract? though, is I, I don't see Jordan miles necessarily doing himself like a ton of favors here. Like certainly I think he'll have a career outside of the WWE, but I, I mean, just judging by some of the reaction, I feel he's done a lot to hurt his own reputation at this point. So um, I it to me it's a different case than you know maybe some Sin Cara or Mike Bennett. Yeah, I I just wonder that if you have not not to say that there's talent that would necessarily uh go to the the lengths that Jordan Miles has of publicly uh slamming the company, but if people really want out of their deals and they're stuck to them, um, and, and they look at this, it's going to be well, um. I can I can just vent my frustrations publicly and I'm going to be such a headache to them that they just let me out. Yeah, we shall see. Anyway, it's a a very difficult story. He's a really talented performer mm-hmm. and I don't know what his end game is if it's just getting out of this contract and and where he goes after this. Um you know, he, you know, he had a lot of negative comments about, you know, he had the Jay Lethal comment that I don't think is going to endear him to, uh, to that company. And then you look elsewhere of like, will, 
other companies be looking at at bringing him in? I mean, he's he's a tremendous talent, and it's just um, do we bring this guy in and worry about something like this happening later down the road? Right. They announced uh, Darby Allen and John Moxley for next week in Indianapolis, so that is official. Nyla Rose destroyed Danny Jordan. This consisted of uh, blocking a choke slam, and then Jordan was clotheslined, hit with a Samoan drop, and then it was a sit out power bomb as it was Air Jordan with Very Rose nice. getting her up in the air and pinning her in a minute thirty six, and that was it. This was one of our first appearances by Nyla Rose on Dynamite. May- since, is is since, this f- since, since the Rio match? Since I think so. Yeah. I don't think she's done much since then. And I get it because, you know, it's not like she was going to have a pay-per-view match. So maybe not necessarily a need. But yeah, I don't even know if she's been on Dark, actually. So, um, but, you know, this was fine. Like a good reintroduction to Nyla Rose, who they're clearly taken very seriously. Um, I also like the fact that they're, you know, they're not afraid to do squash matches on dynamite because he she perfectly benefited from a win in just a short amount of time here yeah they updated dustin Rhodes radial fracture of his left forearm and he's going to be out another three to four weeks and then next week we're going to get the dynamite dozen 12 man battle royal where the final two members in the battle royal will have a singles match in two weeks where the winner will win the diamond ring. A diamond ring, yeah. A diamond ring. A lot of people brought up comparisons to WCW's Battle Bowl as a result of this. Also, oh, DDP's got to present the, the diamond ring to the winner. I think so. Former yeah. holder of said ring. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would assume this, le- you know, to, to be building up to a big angle of some sort. Um, I wonder what. Yeah, someone's got to win this ring and then pop someone in the head with it. Punch them. Maybe yeah. it reopens Cody's cut. Ouch. Shivani interviewed Allie, and they plugged the rankings. Allie is ranked number fourth among the women, and she's been proving it on Dark, but now it's time to do it on Dynamite. And the lights go out. Awesome Kong appears with Brandy, and Allie tries to attack her, gets tossed on the ramp, and they cut out, cut off a piece of her hair to join her expanding uh hair collection with B Priestley's. I like the acknowledgement that Dark exists, first of all, because I don't know how often you would he- even hear about it on in the body of Dynamite. But not just exists, but it exists as sort of like almost like a, a feeder system or like, you know, as a, a pre prelims. It's like a fighter saying it, it was it was their NXT UK and Ali was Flash Morgan Webster. Sure, sure. But I mean, to me, I I almost equate it to like a, a UFC fighter saying, "Ah, oh, I fought a lot in the undercard, but now it's going to be my first main card match." It makes it makes you feel that getting onto Dynamite itself is a big accomplishment for a lot of these performers, and that um, you know you're only seeing the best of the best on Wednesday nights at eight o'clock on on TNT, rather than you know. But you know, for your hardcores, of course, you can still like it. I just love the tearing system of it, you know. And, um, yeah, so, and they reiterated the fact that the rankings would be coming out every Friday uh, at 4 o'clock on their social platforms uh, with the various divisions. Chris Jericho came out. He is still le champion and got a huge pop for that line. He demands, once again, a thank you from the roster and all the members in the office. He lists off all the people he's beaten. Cody isn't as good as he thinks he is. He's an entitled millennial son of a bitch. And then Cody's music plays, but out comes MJF to tons of heat. They're chanting asshole at him to the point that TNT had to censor this. And he said if he didn't throw in the towel, Cody's career would have been over. But the real villain is Cody. Cody couldn't give a shit about the fans. He only cares about himself. The fans are sheep, and he's the only one who knows the true Cody. And the real Cody is a liar who tried to turn him into his own puppet. Cody's a sociopath trying to hold me under his thumb where you can't hold me down. He's the new face of AEW. And meanwhile, this whole time, Jericho's just standing off to the side here. And he addresses Jericho, stating that he heard a rumor that Jericho wants him to join the inner circle. And Jericho heard that MJF wants to join the inner circle. 
So they're referring to each other as Christopher and Maxwell. They're doing just improv back and forth with one another, including Jericho being called, and I quote, crisscross applesauce. You wouldn't think that that would work at all. I will guarantee Jericho makes a shirt out of this. Crisscross applesauce? Do you you think we'll see an inner circle jerk shirt as well? That may be MJF's next shirt. Maybe it's going to look like the old AJ Styles TNA shirt. I th- I think it says a lot about you know the performer when like crisscross applesauce really could have been a um what the hell um what was Roman Reigns thing suffering succotash suffering succotash like un- in the hands of a of a different performer it could have turned out awful but sounded fine here man if if that had come off that way you could have argued that. Crisscross would have made MJF jump the shark. Uh, yeah, you could have. Yeah. <laughs> he says that Jericho may have drank a bit too much if he thinks MJF needs him. Jericho thinks that you are just like me. We're both from Long Island. We both have three letter nicknames. We both enjoy scarves. It's almost like your parents got horny watching me wrestle Juventud Guerrera on an episode of WCW Saturday Night 25 years ago, and then nine months later, out came you. And MJF asked, who is this Juventud? <laughs> who the Poor hell is Juventud? For, for, first The Rock, and now MJF asking the identity of this man. Um, this was like the most attention he's probably had in the wrestling world in years. Do you know he is doing this tour of Canada over November? He's doing... 30 straight nights, including a show in Toronto. Um, Wrestling? In a couple of weeks' time. He's doing 30 straight nights. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah, Amazing. It's crazy. I was looking at this tour the other day. It's just like all small, like just a small independent company that's just traveling across all over Canada. So they argue back and forth, and they're yelling over one another. And then Jericho asks, Do you know who the biggest jackass is in AEW? And they both say, Cody Rhodes. So a direct take from the Jericho Kevin Owens interview that they did. It was the night after Survivor Series. And I think I was at this show. It oh. was in Toronto. Uh, but they this was when they were teasing Jericho and Owens breaking up. And then they said, do you know whose fault this is? And they both said Roman Reigns. And I will say the Owens Jericho one got a bigger pop. Very cool. Very cool. But it was it. a very good line, but. Good Clearly catch. borrowing from that here. So they're on the same page. They didn't make it clear that MJF was in the inner circle, but it was definitely implied in this segment. Was it though? I mean, at the end, it was like they were on the same page. It it kind of felt like he's going to be at least associated with the group. I guess we can we can discuss after um after the the end of the segment. So after all of this, after being called a sociopath, after being called uh, a guy trying to put MJF under his thumb, a puppet, ran down, he's the villain. It was being called a jackass that prompted Cody to finally come out. And he he runs out. Now, was this a big deal or is this me nitpicking? But with, with Cody and MJF in identical purple suits, did it just not look ridiculous visually? I didn't notice the color of Cody's suit. They actually. were, they had, it felt like these two went out and bought suits together. Oh. It just looked really, I, I just, it was, uh, I couldn't ignore it. Uh, I, it didn't bother me, I have to say, but, I don't know, maybe it's something they blew the entire show for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cody, Cody had bigger problems, so he gets into the ring and he just totally screws up this power slam spot with Jericho. I don't know what went wrong here, but man, uh, I couldn't see the ball because Jim Ross was on top of it with citing Cody's equilibrium's off. He can't he can't perform properly. Yeah. And then Cody recovers, and then he hits the power slam a second time uh, properly. So kind of threw out Jim Ross's theory here. But I thought Jim Ross covered this so well. Uh, this thing looked terrible. Jim Ross is a pro, but I, I thought it was notable how Cody was going for Dustin's moves between the power slam and also the uppercut on the ground. Uh, that's right. Yeah, where he got onto the back and did the the slap. Yeah. So it was kind of a weird move. It's like, I'm going to take this back bump before I hit you. 
It gives you a lower yeah. angle, some maybe yeah. added leverage. Yeah, but certainly Dustin and uh, Dustin's coming back for revenge mm-hmm. against the inner circle. So uh, I can see, you know, Cody maybe getting a beat down in a few weeks, and that's Dustin's big return. So then Wardlow appears attacking Cody, spins him off the shoulders, and then chokes Cody with his tie, throwing him over the top rope. And kind of positioning Wardlow is going to be MJF's muscle. Yeah, that's right. I this is where I I I don't know if they these two fit in the in in the inner circle. I mean, I already have my reservations about what MJF how, how MJF might fit in the, in the inner circle when it's already pretty crowded. I would say with five people and five very distinct personalities. Five's me, a good number to me. MJF kind of like oversteps, you know, both Jericho and Sammy Guevara's boundaries. And now, you, especially if you have Wardlow, who is very clearly associated with MJF, if he were to be in, in the inner circle, well, what, what would that make? Jack Swagger. You already have Silent Muscle in that group. So I don't know if I see MJF and Wardlow being a part of Chris Jericho's group, but I do love the two of them together by themselves. I think they're both perfect for like a Sean Diesel type of duo. And, you know, it seems like it's, we are finally now at this point getting a full fledged heel MJF. Here he was unshackled. This was the first time we got to see it in full force on AEW TV, and he was fantastic. The man shared the stage here with Chris Jericho, and it was almost like seeing, like, you know, pe- present and future versions of like the same type of guy. Though I have to say, I thought MJF outshined even Chris Jericho here. You know, to me, there's no one on this roster who appears to be as quick witted or as comfortable speaking in front of a microphone than this guy. Like he throw, he feels just like, like like a throwback to so many like top heels of the past that you never see today, and 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 even somebody like potentially as charismatic as The Rock. So God, he he's so so damn good, and I'm glad we're finally getting getting to see like the heel show, despite the fact that you know I think the criticisms about them perhaps executing this this turn too soon could, I still have them personally. Yeah, no, I I thought both guys were great in this. I thought Jericho kind of deferred and gave MJF the stage here. Like, this was his big promo coming off the turn on on Saturday. And, like, it was an awkward pairing because it's the two top heels on different pages. uh, But then they come together at the end. So it kind of wrapped itself up. uh, A very strong segment here and sets up, you know, kind of Cody's detour path that he's probably going to have to go through Wardlow and before he can even get to MJF. Warlow, then MJF, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe a tag team match. Uh, could be. Yeah, that that would make sense. Pack and Hangman Page. Match number three in the series. Pac so they're of, calling this the rubber match, but they also called the match on the pay-per-view the rubber match, didn't they? I thought they did during the match. Yeah. Um, because I think they referred to like the tag match as somehow meaning something. But now you're supposed to forget the tag so This match. is a real rubber match. Okay. So Pack immediately goes for the black arrow, and Page rolls away. Uh, Pack hits the moonsault off the top to the floor, stealing Page's move, and then Page rolls out of a shooting star press attempt and hits a suicide dive. Uh, they went through a commercial break here uh, after Page hit his moonsault to the floor, and then we got some great stuff back and forth between these two. There was a snap German by Pack, and then followed with another. Page landed on its feet, hit a discus lariat. Both are down. Pack then is seated on the chair on the floor. And he teases doing the spot from Saturday where he would go for the brain buster, but instead Page countered it and he hit his own brain buster onto the floor. Thankfully, Pac probably just said, you're not hitting that move to me on a chair. I'm, there's no fucking way. And then Page hit the buckshot lariat, two count, and then Pac starts stomping on Page's head and Bryce Remsburg is trying to get in there and stop. He continues with the stomps. Page is out and then he hits the black arrow into the brutalizer and gets the win. And he's looking possessed here. He won't release the hold. And the announcers made it pretty emphatic that he has won the series and it's Pac moving on and Paige takes the loss. I really like the match. I'm trying to figure out the booking because I think coming out of Saturday, it felt like they were maybe, you know, giving Paige sort of the, the 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 win in the series because uh, I thought that was the rubber match of course but uh, it feels like I wonder why that they did that other than to perhaps just do the match again so that they both men could have a match on the pay per view but ultimately here have Pack 
come out of it as, you know, the guy getting all the value. Yeah, it's it's kind of strange. It was sort of like this wasn't 50-50. Like you had a definitive winner of the feud, but they still gave something to Page here that he is the one to get the first singles win over Pac. Uh, right. I, I don't know how much I, 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 I'm crazy about that. Like it's, it's like a participation trophy here at the expense of Pac's undefeated streak that if you're building him up for something notable, I would have just kept him undefeated here um, and culminated this at the pay-per-view rather than the TV afterwards because Saturday was really just the setup for this. Yeah, that's how it felt like. Unless they do a fourth and a fifth match. I don't uh, think they will. They were pretty strong at the end of this. Like, this is the end of the feud. I don't think so either. But, you know, at, at the same time, I'm very curious to see where Paige comes out of, out of this. How how Paige comes out of this. Because I think he had taken a couple losses. And then it kind of set him off on a course where it seemed like we were getting, like, a really angry hangman Paige that was teasing a heel turn. Uh, that you know, seemed to be angry at the entire world. And it was great. I feel like that was kind of derailed here with whatever was going on with Pac. Um, but, you know, he could still pick it back up and still be that angry, pissed off guy since he did definitively get knocked out and lose this uh, uh, program with Pac. Yeah, the key was being knocked out because that would play into the next angle as well. Um, because then we cut to the back and the Young Bucks are brawling with Santana and Ortiz And Ortiz puts Matt Jackson through a table. And then Santana leaps off a forklift. Nick gets sent into the bathroom door where Orange Cassidy is behind the door and gets a big pop. And I can understand, like, doing this. But this was such an intense brawl. I don't know if this was the cameo necessary for the tone they were looking to achieve here. I agree. I agree. I think this, you know, by the end, they got over it. But at the time, it almost felt like it, it belonged in sort of like a 24-7 segment. Yeah, it was like you had to then build. It's like you were escalating the tension, and then the air was out of the balloon with Orange Cassidy, and then you had to like re- reignite everything here. So they mm-hmm. continue the brawl throughout the commercial break, and they make their way out to the stage area. And the Bucks are just getting killed here. Ortiz uses the loaded sock on Matt, and then Santana takes it and drills Nick repeatedly into his injured right leg coming out of the pay-per-view. And they followed by spray painting a circle on the stage, the same place where they put the, uh, the rock and roll express through and Matt got power bomb through the stage and Brandon Cutler gets beaten down here. The what, bucks are dead. What was great was that like Brandon Cutler comes out and then like Ortiz and Santana are like, Oh, oh, oh no, it's Brandon Cutler. Let's leave. So they actually leave. Before they just said, just kidding. Like as if, and they just beat up Brandon Cutler. So, I mean, the idea that they were teasing, that they were afraid of Brandon Cutler, who I think is being treated like Matt and Nick's really weak jobber friend, I thought was really funny. That's what they, they did on Being the Elite, where they got the kid to pin Brandon Cutler, and they said, well, your record already sucks, so you take the pin. <laughs> uh, so, Private Party comes out to try and help them, and that's when the brawl ends. And I thought that what made this so great is that they gave logical reasons why Kenny Omega, Cody, and Hangman Page all could not come out to help them. They had explanations for all three. I didn't even think about that. But yeah, you're absolutely Omega right. Omega is not yeah. cleared. He's gone. Cody just got beaten down and is selling the effects of Saturday. And Hangman had just been knocked out in the prior segment. And I thought that level of detail is something that we just assume is not going to be considered. And it was here. And I think that should be applauded. That's a great point. Because I, this was a long brawl and you're starting to wonder why won't anyone help the Bucks and their teammates all have reasons that they couldn't come. I thought it was a really excellent brawl. It was the first time I saw a back, backstage brawl in picture pic, picture in picture in the middle, middle of a commercial and I'm really curious to know like how they determine what to put in these picture in picture segments beyond just, you know, uh, I don't know, the body of a match. Because this week we saw pretty much like an entire, I would say a pretty important segment and a really hot looking brawl in there. I think as a way to get people to stick around during a commercial break to not flip to the other channel, it really worked for me. I found it visually interesting enough, more so than even a match that that doesn't require sound for you to really enjoy. And I certainly found something oddly amusing about like 
seeing guys dive off of like shit while seeing like a family drive down a picturesque mountain in a Kia commercial. <laughs> it was it was really strange, but I liked it. Great intensity from both teams, especially proud and powerful. Um, I loved how they added the the touch of them drawing an inner circle now on the on the stage, which appears to be I think their version of like I guess they do do um have they done like a an announcer table break yet on AEW? Not the announcer the announcer's so, desk. So if it's not that, then I'm guessing this like stage break is sort of like their new their version of it. You know, it allows them to do a big cr- crunching sound um in a constant area that's always there and i like it i like it a lot and for now it seems to be proud and proud and powerful's like signature spot it, it certainly makes them stand out and uh, it's a great variation of the announced table break i think they need some laundry detergent spots to contrast with the loaded sock at the same time that would be great to have in the Ooh, picture, picture that'd be great yeah they're th- comparing like oh look how much better this detergent is when comparing sock color <laughs> <laughs> they they could certainly do that. Nick getting blasted in the leg with a cue ball inside of a sock. Yeah, uh, it, it sets up a number of things too. You know, it, it it played up. I think existing injuries to was Nick selling his leg on Saturday. What was he selling? Yeah, because he, he kicked the post right in the okay. match. That so was the big thing. They continue to attack the leg with the baseballs. So Nick's leg is still fucked. Matt's lower back now is fucked because of the the power bomb on the stage. So next time these two have matches, like, I think it'll make for some great, you know, young box body part selling s- s- elements in-, in the match. And of course, it also sets up a uh, private party versus proud and powerful, too. I did think like the attack was so vicious that seeing the bucks at the end on their feet, they were being helped to the back. But like that was pretty severe that mm-hmm. the fact that they were up and, you know, Nick's like walking to the back while he's holding on to the guys and Matt's just been put through the stage and he's up. I, I could have gone without seeing them have to get up to their feet because that was, you know, he's, he's being hit with that loaded sock multiple times in the leg. That guy should not be able to walk. I agree with you. I, I don't think you want the lasting image uh, to be of the bucks walking away. I would have loved to, you know, just go off like the entire segment thinking that they were on a hospital bed somewhere and they could be, but unconscious is maybe what how i want to think of it so and this is really cool they're going to do santana and ortiz against private party which was set up here at the end and they went out of their way to mention that they are paying tribute to matt travis who passed away last weekend and i saw david bixen's band actually suggest this exact idea of having these two teams do like a tribute match wow. and they're going to do it next week and i i thought it was really cool that they brought up Matt Travis here, and these four all having a connection there um, through that that Northeast scene. Um, so that's really cool that they're doing this next week. It's really cool. Was it weird, though, that it came as a result of this, what was supposed to be like a imp- spontaneous angle? I, I don't know how much they will make mention of it next week because, yeah, it is a, a feud. It is like a heel team versus a babyface team, and... If they're going to make uh, position it as a tribute match, um, maybe it's only Excalibur mentioning this here. But nonetheless, I was glad that he brought it up here mm-hmm. and mentioned that, like that this the, the, this guy who passed away on Saturday uh, had connections to all four of these guys. Yeah. So yeah. SCU comes out for the main event. Uh, they did their worst town ever deal, but said they hate the town, but they love the fans. And it was uh, Sky and wrestling, uh, Sky and Kaz wrestling the match. Correct. Yes, against Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara for the AEW Tag Titles. Do you want to know Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara? Well, I guess that's enough. Yeah. Well, the AEW champion. <laughs> it gets maybe that gets your per, uh, I, well, one I, win equals like four. What was Jericho's justification for for the match? Didn't they're he say- undefeated as a team? I mean, all right. I don't know. I don't know if I I think that's good enough. Like, did they? Was it? Was it also because both of them were undefeated or something? Well, these two team together. Uh, yeah, but there a are a lot match. of. Aren't there a lot a number of teams that are that you can qualify for as also undefeated? Um, tag team setting. I don't know who's undefeated, but I would imagine that. I mean, probably every. I, I'm trying to think of any teams that might be undefeated. Santana and Ortiz. Yeah. 
Yeah, so maybe Santana and Ortiz should have made a bigger... Well, maybe they deferred to Jericho and Guevara. Okay. Jericho's sure. the leader. He gets right. the tag title shot. They had the advantage on Kazarian as they went through the commercial break. Uh, Sammy Guevara did this pose, and then Jericho joined in with him in the ring. There was a Spanish fly by Sammy in the middle of the ring and then missed with a shooting star press. The hot tag is made to Scorpio Sky, and with Tony Schiavone back in the booth, he also uh, he also jumped on the Sammy G bandwagon. It's a bit easier to say. Sammy G? Did you hear we uh, we now have Mustafa Ali? He's back. Yeah. He's back once but again. But we lost Stu. That's Grayson. right. That's right. He's just Grayson now. Mm-hmm. Man. Maybe maybe they could have made a swap. Stu Ali. Hmm. Stu Ali. Hmm. Slingshot cutter by Sky onto Sammy G. Then he applied a dragon sleeper. Jericho broke that up. SCU later was stopped when Jake Hager pulled Kazarian to the floor and knocked him out. Daniels then dove onto Hager but got caught and run into the guardrail. So Kazarian and Daniels are effectively taken out. And Sky is left with Jericho. He hits him with a TKO, only gets a two count. Jericho goes for a lion salt, lands on the knees. Then a cutter gets stopped. Sky comes off the turnbuckle and caught with a code breaker in midair. Everyone, I think, was buying that this could be the finish. But Scorpio Sky kicks out. And then out of nowhere, he uses an inside cradle to catch Chris Jericho in 1044. And Chris Jericho suffers his first loss in AEW. If you had Scorpio Sky in your pool, congratulations. You <laughs> cashed out tonight as the first one to beat Chris Jericho. And then Jericho uh, reverted to his 1997 uh, persona uh, and just threw a tantrum, hitting the post with the chair shot. I I, I thought this was a, a really cool finish. You know, I love the booking here. This was a big-time upset and certainly one you didn't expect coming from a tag team wrestler and not a singles wrestler even. Um, I think in one match, you certainly made Scorpio Sky, and they didn't have to even split up SCU or have them lose the belts as a result. It it makes me really excited because I think it establishes an, an unpredictable and unconventional booking style in AEW booking. So, you know, it's not just them introducing new styles of matchups, but introducing new ways of building characters and title matches in ways that we haven't seen in North American wrestling in a very long time that makes me curious to see a lot more of what AEW has to offer in the weeks ahead. I did feel, I don't know if it was because they were running low on airtime or what, I, I kind of felt like the ending was a little bit rushed here. The match turned out really well, but I think we were robbed of a bit of a major show closing call from JR that I think would, would really help would have helped emphasize the upset here of, of Sky beating the champion. Yeah, so you'll probably end up getting a, a title match between these two on TV at some point in yeah. the next few weeks. Maybe you do that at the Sears Center. Maybe you do that. Um, yeah, I, I could see that being at the Sears Center in two weeks. I could see that. I, I'm also curious about how this will play into any type of storyline involving SCU themselves. I mean, I imagine Sky loses that one and somehow it plays into like the, their next title def- defense. But I'm not any clearer on maybe what Chris Daniels' role is in all this. You know, all the potential storylines that you and I had maybe discussed of him missing out on, on the action. Um, that None of that seemed to be hinted at at all. In fact, he was just a manager here. So... I'm still waiting to see maybe if they have any further plans because I'd be disappointed if they didn't. What'd you think of the tonight's episode? I thought it was really good. It continues to, I would say, remedy early criticisms of AEW not featuring enough promos. You certainly had a great deal of it this on, on this show with Moxley and MJF. I also think you're starting to see a lot of the non-star performers develop into stars. Like I said, with MJF having a big outing, Jurassic Express, Darby Allen had really good outings, and of course, at the end of the show with Scorpio Sky. So, I, to me, any show where like you can come out of it thinking about five new stars, five six new stars, I would classify personally as a really good show. All right, well, that was the episode. Let us go to the feedback and see what everyone had to say. Forum postwrestling.com. Tonight's poll: What did you think of AEW Dynamite? On a scale of 1 to 10, you gave this show an 8. So strong reaction from our forum. 
Paul from New Jersey kicks things off. I love the bit of storytelling that has Kenny unable to be cleared by doctors, yet Moxley was. It's a nice little wrinkle to the story, and I really like the way it was shot. I never cared for Dean Ambrose, yet John Moxley is clearly capable of telling great stories and cutting fiery promos. I particularly enjoyed Moxley calling Omega a radical son of a bitch. MJF and Jericho is my segment of the night. The heat from Maxwell was nuclear, and I thought they played off each other in fantastic fashion. Who knew Ho- Who knew Hoovy was an aphrodisiac? We go to Brandon from Oshawa who says, I was so close to giving this show a 10. Other shows had better matches and better angles, but this show as a whole put everything together so nicely. This was some more promo time. I love the Moxley, Allen, and MJF Jericho promos. I love the angle with the Jurassic Express and Dark Order, and I'm really looking forward to this feud. Evil Uno was the star of the show for me. I know the Dark Order gimmick has gotten a lot of hate, but he's been the one to make it work for me and why I've been a fan since day one. I wish Wardlow had a few more video videos leading up to his debut, but I like him with MJF. The one thing I'm taking a point away for is Scorpio Sky pinning Chris Jericho. I get that they want to push Sky, but I found it really stupid and it should take more than that to beat the world champion, at least right now, so early on. Ryan writes, hard to believe that with 50 years of experience between Kazarian and Jericho, the tag team main event was the first time they've met. Another great show. Noah from Vaughn, what a great show. Loved Hangman vs. Pac, and the main event was really solid. Moxley vs. Allen should be awesome for next week. I love the subtle reference to the Jericho Owen segment after Survivor Series in 16. Just great stuff from both guys. Overall, it seems AEW really does listen to feedback. So many promos tonight, and it helped so much for all the people that got speaking time. A 9.5 out of 10 show. Alexander, very solid show. While nothing seemed must-see, it was a show that did not drag at all. For what it's worth, I think the Dark Order are being booked excellently. Look at them. It's a dude in a mask called Evil Uno, his sidekick, and the Putty Patrol. These guys are villains from Power Rangers, and it was fantastic seeing Luchasaurus play the role of Megazord, (laughs) wreaking havoc over them. If Pac decides to go back to superhero Neville, he's got perfect opponents. Speaking of Pac, he had his first clean one-on-one loss in the U.S. in about two years when he lost a... Uh, hangman at full gear if the end result of the feud was neville pinning pack twice do you feel his first clean singles loss was wasted i feel like the story could have been built up yeah we discussed that part earlier you could argue that we go to gerard who says a lot of people have said dynamite needed more promos and angles i'm not necessarily against that but i felt the jericho and and mjf promo while awesome went just a little too long as did the attack from santana and ortiz i know this take might put me in the minority Felt like the main event was rushed as a result of the long promo and angles, which was too bad because I still think it was the best match of the show, but could have used two or three more minutes. That being said, I'm glad AEW is keeping away from hot shotting things and building their storylines and wrestlers properly. I am stoked for Scorpio Sky versus Chris Jericho. Matt writes, great show all around. The main event was a bit off with some of the spots not working out. Jericho looked a bit slow, but maybe that was part of part of it ending with the pin. My wife came in during the match and asked about Sammy Guevara. Who is this guy? A budget Finn Balor? What do you think about the win-loss records resetting like different hockey seasons? I think it will make for excellent storytelling, like how the St. Louis Blues went from terrible to winning the Stanley Cup. Having a guy lose for a season and then having a huge comeback, the next sounds intriguing. 8 out of 10 show. Yeah, this is about the uh, uh, item that the, what is it, that they could reset the records in January at the start of the year? Yeah, was this an official something that was actually said? I by don't know if they've Con? officially announced it. I think it was just discussed. As um, let me just pull it up here. I think Nick Jackson made a made okay. a comment about it. Um, uh, I, I, he was he was asked, "Do you have a way of booking around the possible problems down the road that you may encounter with the win loss record?" And he just responded, "It'll reset." Um, hmm. So there you go. I, I, I mean, you know, we have to see how it plays out, but I really don't dislike the idea as long as I think there are repercussions for people who, you know, like, 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 it, like it happens in, in real sports. Let's say somebody finishes number one, um, you know, or, or somebody finishes at the bottom. Um, does it affect their draft picks or does it? Aff- <laughs> I guess we don't have draft picks. Uh, okay. It, if you finish number one in the conference, you have home advantage, right? In the playoffs. Like, as long as I think we see some repercussions and that you don't just throw everything out for no reason, um, I'm curious. I think it could work out. You know, you you might end up in the position where somebody's like 105 versus, I don't know, somebody who's like 1-0. and 0 And, I mean, it happens in, in MMA and in boxing. Yeah, I mean, it's... 
the counter is these records that just keep piling up for eternity. And you get to a point where I think it gets tougher to tell stories when you're talking about someone that's uh, 25 and 18. Um, so it, it can be done well. I think so far the records for all the the panic that it instilled in people when they introduced this and how this was going to be so confusing. I think it's been used in a pretty pretty good manner like it's not overbearing it's not the central focus of the show the records it's there and they've been able to tell some stories through it but it's it, it's to me it's not over overstepping its its use on the show it's still really early you know but even this early i think you run into i would say some things that don't really add up like in my opinion this chris jericho sammy Guevara getting a title shot or even amy sakura getting a title shot I, I suppose, I don't know, maybe somehow it works out with both of those people being 1-0. and But, I mean, hasn't Allie been getting enough? Whatever, doesn't matter. I We'll see. We'll see how it plays out. I, I think it's still pretty early. My turn. We go to Baruch from Phoenix who says, Dope show. MJF and Jericho still should have a promo together once every few months at least. That was terrific. I love that AEW doesn't pretend all these wrestlers' careers started here. They'll reference damn near anything from all these guys' past, and it's great. I'm not sure what the ultimate payoff to the Brandy Kong stuff is. Do they ultimately go after the title, or just collecting heads to collect heads? Darby Island as the next opponent for Moxley is a real natural fit. I'm sure Moxley wins, yet will come out of it loving Allen even more. Luchasaurus is so over for not having done a whole lot. And I don't mean that in a negative way. He just has such a magnetic presence when he's in the ring. We've only gotten a small taste of it, of what he has to offer, and we're dying for more. Question, do you guys think Dynamite touches a million viewers again before the year ends? A million. Um, I'll say yes. I'm going to say no. Okay, we'll see. Um, MJ. Uh, he asks here... About MJF, did he join the inner circle? Would love him to turn on Jericho as he's positioned to be the most hated guy on the roster and now has muscle. MJF and Wardlow versus Jericho and Hager feels perfect. Love that they keep actively putting talent in spots to get over, citing Luchasaurus, MJF, Darby Allen, and Scorpio Sky. They have good top star power, but it's when these other tier guys feel like big stars that the show goes up a level. Wouldn't have minded the Bucks being written off with the beatdown tonight. I would have liked Cody to be kept off TV a bit longer. What's the rush and build to his return promo? I don't think they gave away too much with Cody tonight. It was it was a run in. He didn't talk, and I, I think it was pretty subdued. Uh, Cody's presence on the show overall, and and I think he needed to be there, uh, especially for the beatdown later to give a reason for all the elite guys to be kind of taken out earlier. We get a Chris who says, "I loved it. Could have been my favorite episode yet." I thought the wrestling was strong while giving us some sports entertainment, and MJF and Jericho in the ring together was pure gold. My one small criticism is that I think they overuse the lights out to introduce somebody too often. And he says, congratulations on picking a great theme that holds up at 1.5 times the speed as well. Well, thank you. That's, oh, just, well, yeah. that's the hidden criteria. Yes, and, and again, thank you to Jacob Chestnut for the wonderful theme that opens up our show every single week. Um do you think they're overusing the lights up thing a little too often between the dark order order and, and Kong? Um, I can't say it has uh, uh, registered once for me of how many times the lights get turned off for an entrance. Mm. Uh, before we go, we have the results of a very informal poll that we put up at post wrestling on Twitter, where we simply asked, what did you watch tonight? You know, judging uh, uh, because of the very close race we had last week, I was really curious to know how things would uh, uh, pan out this week. And according to our very informal poll, 27% of you decided to watch WWE NXT, while 73% of you watched AEW Dynamite. So we shall see if that is reflected in the ratings. Uh, Last bit of news here. This just came in as we were doing the show. But uh, Court Bauer from MLW tweeted out just now, I want to thank Filthy Tom Lawler for his two years with MLW. Tom was a day zero guy that helped relaunch the league in October 2015. I wish him continued success with the next chapter of his career. First class dude who, despite being filthy, is somehow all class at the same time. So that would appear uh, Tom Lawler's deal was coming due with MLW, and it looks like he is moving onward. Very interesting. Do you? What do you see for him? 
uh, I'd be, I think Tom is going to be in a good position Mm -hmm. of where he would want to go. I could see, I could certainly see impact being very aggressive uh, to, to want to go after him. I, it'll be interesting what, 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 level of offers Tom Lawler gets at this point. I think he's someone that, that could get some, he he's got like buzz about him mm-hmm. and can do, I think he's a very underrated talent as well. I don't think enough people have seen like the improvements this guy has made. I saw one of his, you know, he, he was a pro wrestler before he went to the UFC, uh, but then returned to it. And I remember seeing a match with him very early on during his return to wrestling with, uh, Kyle O'Reilly and just where he was at that point. And now you look uh, today, I was just uh, chatting with uh, our friend Dan Lovransky the other day, and he just raved to me about the Tom Lawler, Timothy Thatcher match at the MLW pay-per-view uh, two weeks ago. I can see Tom getting offers from pretty much anybody. Um, I guess, you you know, at this point you have to wonder perhaps where he might best fit for his career. Um, where do you see him having the best opportunity? I would say, just looking at all things considered, um, Tom's 36 years old at the moment. Um, I wonder if he'll fit in well in NXT. Um, AEW, maybe. Uh, I could certainly see somebody like Impact making him like a featured prominent star i i think i think impact would be somewhere that yeah they would bring him in and i think he'd be positioned as a top guy in impact if he came in right off the bat now does he is impact something he's he's looking to do um is is impact a lateral move from mlw at this yeah point? yeah that's you have to wonder what 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 does he want to be doing so mm. Um, you know, certainly everybody is looking at those those big offers that WWE or AEW could provide, or Japan, if that's that's a realistic option. But I mean, New Japan to me is just so full of numbers at the moment that I, I don't know if that would be a place that he could uh, just navigate to, um, mm-hmm. and if he would be looking at at wrestling elsewhere. But certainly on on the independent level, like he is somebody that you know when when the blood sports come around, like. Yep. Him and Game Changer, like that's a that's a perfect marriage, but oh, that's man. also not that's not a um place that you can, you know, make the same money that you can with a, a full time national promotion, obviously. I certainly hope by the time the next blood sport comes around that Tom hopefully hasn't signed yet. And even if he has signed, I would love for him to reprise his role as a commentator for Blood Sport. I thought he added he was, so much. Yeah. So yeah. Um, he's the perfect type of commentator for that type of style of match. So I don't know. I hope there's some role for him in, in that in that setting as well. Final, final topic, and then we'll get out of here. Do you remember where you were on this date in 2005? It was a very sad day. It was the passing mm-hmm. of Eddie Guerrero. Do you remember uh, anything about that day? Um, I remember the exact phone call, actually, that I had because um, I believe I was set to come into call screen for the law and you had actually called me earlier in the, in the day, John, asking me if I'd heard the news, and I didn't. So you were the first to break the news to me. And oh wow! I was I was stunned. I mean, he's as many people I think of our age, like one of our favorites throughout many years. Um, so it was, you know, bizarre. Like, but that was also at a time where I feel like I, as a wrestling fan, like very early on, you you kind of like have lived through experiences like that often. Um, hearing Especially somebody... in that, that, that time period where there, yeah. there were a lot of those. Yeah. And yeah. But you know, one that... thing I'm, I'm very thankful of the fact that we don't get as mm-hmm. many of those, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, not to say they're eradicated, but yeah. it's, it's far less than at a time where man, it was just constant. But you know, I, I mean, that one certainly like, for me, stung a lot more than than the others, just because he he was a constant favorite throughout throughout the the years. Uh, but I remember doing the law that night, I believe, you know, yep. in that that excellent edition of the show that you Dan and Jay put together, just um, with a number of wonderful phone calls talking about Eddie Guerrero. So those are my my memories. Yourself? I remember. I, I it it was the Sunday morning. I was I was working as a board op at at six forty. So. Uh, 
th- that that would happen frequently where I'd I'd work during the day at 6:40 and then there'd be a pay-per-view which there was at night there was a TNA pay-per-view and then I'd just stay and do the show and it was a long day there at the radio station and I remember getting the news and then as I'm on the board uh Jeff Merrick had actually called in to relay a message to one of the hosts and I'm hearing the host that I'm in the same room with board hopping and they're talking to Jeff and I said can can you pass me the phone and I spoke to Jeff and like he actually knew Eddie on a personal level and sadly I had to break the news to him as well because he had not heard about it and he was obviously just shocked by this news it was this was I recall pretty early on on Sunday that the news had gotten out and then it was re kind of reprogramming our show for that night because you know it was pay-per-view night we kind of had our our format in place and I remember we had Shane Douglas on the show that night and we still had him on we didn't shift that and I remember trying to get different people onto the show I remember I, I believe I called Benoit actually because they had to do the you, you remember they had to do the tapings that night because they were set to go on the European tour. So think of that, that those guys had to find out this news on a Sunday morning and then tape TV that night and, Mm -hmm. and work this show. And then for most of that crew, get on a plane and go over for the European tour. Oh, awful. Yeah, it was terrible. Uh, It was terrible. It's just a, a really, really sad day that I always remember on November the 13th. So that's going to uh, end the show. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, checking out the show. Uh, we will be back on Thursday, 3 o'clock Eastern time with the Cafe Hangout. Andrew Thompson will be jumping on with us to chat all of the latest news that's going on, and we will be taking your phone calls the entire show as well. So look out for that, and that's it. Good night, everybody.